بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه. So this is the fourth in our series of uh, explorations of what Muslim equivalents there might be to the rather Western managerial secular linear category of leadership in the context of submission to God and divine omnipotence. We really need to uh, interrogate that category and I've spoken at length about that already. You might recall that we have been broadening our uh, horizons to include, and not just for obvious contemporary reasons, uh, the female possibilities of leadership. And we looked at that paradigm, Hajar, uh, and I want to continue that, although this may be the only other female personality that, that I invoke, to look at uh, a recurrent but neglected possibility that has been present in our heritage that for reasons connected to the Muslim love of privacy and discretion uh, tends not to fill our imaginary archives when we think of the great leaders or figure, exemplum figures of uh, the Muslim past. But since uh, females are half of the Ummah and we are often interrogated about this issue in particular, it is as well to have some data up our sleeves. Uh, we note that uh, because uh, this is the religion of Hayat, modesty, the religion of hijab, it's kind of the khuluq of Islam. The Holy Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, li kulli deen in khuluq, wa khuluq al-islam al-hayat. Every religion has its own characteristic virtue, and the characteristic virtue of Islam is modesty, if you're going to translate hayat as modesty. Now, obviously, it refers to males as well, and the Holy Prophet was well known for his own hayat. Uh, but in the context of our reticence about the male-female engagement in the public sphere, something characteristically Islamic, uh, we find that the female contributions to the leadership paradigm in the Ummah is somewhat occluded. You have to read between the lines uh, because they didn't want to be known. You have, in their case, a particular uh, instance of the problem that we invoked in the first lecture, which is that what really does it mean to be a leader when the Holy Prophet والسلام, says, La imara, don't seek leadership. Hmm. So uh, thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of charismatic females in particular on a history, their names will not be recalled, although modern scholars try to uh, look for some indicative exceptions. Uh, one of the exceptions that I want to look at uh, uh, in this series, uh, uh, who will form the main focus of today's uh, discussion, uh, is uh, one of the best known figures of uh, Muslim Hauserland. So Zainab's going to be very happy because we're talking about West Africa now. A neglected region of Muslim cultural and intellectual achievement. When the Ansar al-Din, that misnamed faction, rolled into Timbuktu four years ago, the world discovered that actually there's more manuscript in the libraries of Timbuktu than in Oxford and Cambridge put together, the great black African city of learning. And I've been there, and the libraries are indeed scrupulously kept by aged, erudite gentlemen, and it is still a city of scholars. So West Africa, one of these five regions of Islam that we talked about, the five colors of Islam, and one that tends not to be within our field of vision sufficiently. But uh, a number of scholars have brought that world to our attention, even though those whose focus tends to assume that the Arab world is normative or the subcontinental world is normative, tend not to know much about those great areas of Muslim devotion and jihad and piety and tasawwuf and tafsir and memorization and we need to know that because it's a very important part of the ummah demographically. So Nana Asma'u, the famous uh, mother of the scholars of uh, early 19th century Hauserland, uh, buried in Sokoto, uh, will be the focus of today's search for paradigms. 
You'll note that she is before the dawn of modernity. We began by looking at Imam Shamil, who very much is a figure of that uh, transitional age between a very traditional, timeless, fitri life in the mountains of the North Caucasus, which had endured for centuries without much change, and suddenly the eruption of modernity, steam engines, artillery, modern forms of communication and military prowess. And he, like Abdul Qadir al stands at the meeting point of the two ages and the two civilizations. But Nana Asma'u and her father, uh, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, are from before that time. There's a few English explorers who was kind of wandering around at the time, the beginning of the 19th century, but the British invasion of Hauseland doesn't happen for at least another 70 or 80 years. So she's not a figure who you can conjure with as an exemplum of how to deal with modernity. No, she is from uh, a timeless uh, uh, Muslim antiquity. But we have um, a lot of information about her and her own writings. and. Uh, Jean Boyd and Beverly Mack, who are the two main scholars, I think they're Americans who've worked on her, have produced a, a huge volume of English translations of her, her writings. So we have sort of direct insight into her mind. She's not just known through hearsay. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the story of Islam in those huge and populous places and the development of the learned scholarly traditions, and it is very much a land of, of ulama, Maliki Fiqh, Ashari Kalam, and Qadri, and Tijani Tasawwuf. Uh, the origins of it begins with uh, 11th, 12th century Murabitun movements uh, and the Muwahidun based in Marrakesh, who weren't just looking north to Al Andalus but also looked south. Lucrative trade routes, gold, slaves, ivory to the uh, south caravan routes over the Sahara and into the lands of the Sahel where rain starts to fall and things start getting green again. Uh, but those areas are largely uh, captured for Islam not through the sword but by a very slow process of intermarriage, percolation, substitution of one worldview for another. So Senegal for instance which is said now to be the world's most religious Muslim country in terms of the people are actually observant. If you go there, you see how extraordinary it is. Um, that uh, Islam didn't come there through the sword, but largely through um, missionary work by the tariqas and merchants, and the fact that it had access to the Atlantic Ocean also made it a little bit less inaccessible than some other areas of inland Africa. And then the establishment of the city of Timbuktu, the presence even of Andalusian refugees in Timbuktu, Timbuktu's link through uh, uh, caravan routes to Marrakesh and other routes. When I was in Timbuktu, we were shown a well. And we were told, if you dive into this well deep enough, you come up in another well in Marrakesh. <laughs> didn't, didn't try that. But they have a kind of imagination that they're, they're connected to this, the great southern Muslim city of, of Marrakesh, even though there is Africa. There's elephants nearby, there's hippos in the river. It's certainly not Morocco. So uh, Islam is moving along the coast and moving south down these caravan routes uh, being carried particularly by the Qadiriya. Tijaniya, of course, a lot later. If you go to Senegal and Mali today, everybody seems to be either Tijani or Qadiri, but the, the Tijaniya are a later uh, introduction. Uh, and the creation of great centers of learning, the ones that you know, even Western Muslims will go to Kaulak and Tulba Dar es Salaam, particularly those who are, for instance, of Afro-Caribbean extraction. There's quite a few in Kaulak at the moment, which is a big Tijani center in, in uh, Senegal. Basically, these are 19th century establishments, and the earlier traditions of scholarship are in other areas, not just Timbuktu, which we might, uh, which we might talk about. And the creation, of course, of the great mosques of West Africa, famous one in Djenne, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but also in Bobo Diolasso, which is the second city of Upper Volta, um, Burkina Faso, which is a truly amazing, gigantic structure of adobe, uh, unbaked clay and logs, and it's, yeah, it's, it's an African civilization, and it's the Islamic civilization of Africa. So uh, this is not 
uh, something that is happening amongst primitive people, but amongst people who produce great heights of scholarship, 80,000 manuscripts in Timbuktu. And still there's people coming in from the desert and uh, savanna around Timbuktu with sacks, and they say, oh, here's my grandfather's books, he's died, does anybody want to buy them? And there are these wonders. Uh, it's a place of real erudition. The South African government recently built a new conference centre in Timbuktu, exploring this way of pushing back against the white man's idea of the dark continent. Actually, more books in Timbuktu than in anywhere in Europe at the time. Uh, and the processes of Islamization also facilitated by pilgrimage routes and the practice of the Sufi Turok of sending out adepts to remote places to call the people to Islam. Um, when I was in Germany for a conference last week, I met somebody from Benin. Mm. He lives in Paris, dresses in the traditional sort of blue African thing with the hat, very colourful. Spoke the most incredibly beautiful, immaculate 19th century Collège de France, French, amazing. And he said, why don't you come to our Molid in Paris? 20,000 people come. 20,000 West Africans at a Molid in Paris. It's uh, enough to make Mirine Le Pen go into <laughs> palpitations. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a demographically significant uh, space. And of course, growing demographically, uh, because uh, HIV tends not to hit the Muslims in Africa as badly as it hits the Christians. So in Guinea, for instance, which is a Muslim country in West Africa, HI HIV transmission is about 5%. Um, in Botswana, the most Christian country in Africa, it's 28%. And 61% of children in Botswana are on retrovirals. It's you know, uh, catastrophic. And again, the Muslim idea of hayat, modesty, keep the genders apart, does save a lot of lives. Uh, a friend of mine used to uh, work with a uh, US-sponsored uh, radio station in Botswana. And the State Department said, we really need to do something about HIV awareness. And he said, well, the only thing in Africa that really seems to keep HIV down is Islam. So what we should do is use this American railway station for the propagation of Islam. The State Department went quiet for a couple of months, and then they thought this wasn't quite uh, in keeping with the principle of the separation of religion and state. But um, in any case, those are interesting places worth going to. Uh, if you've looked at the little interview I did on one of the Travelling Light episodes, which we did in Senegal, I did it with somebody called Serin Ahmed Olongabu, who's one of the ulama of the Wolof peoples, and he talks a lot about a place called Futa Jallon. Futa Jallon is kind of the, the Kaaba, the ultimate point of the uh, Muslim scholarly tradition of uh, West Africa. It's a big mountainous area. Um, and they call it the Switzerland of Africa. It's physically very beautiful, a lot of mountains. It's sandstone mountains with deep ravines full of rainforest. And just about everybody there is said to be a Hafiz. And they have great madrasas. And uh, it's from the Futa Jalon that a lot of the uh, 19th century movements, including the one that we're going to be looking at, tend to uh, originate because some of the patterns of what's called the Fulani Jihad emerge in the early and mid uh, 18th century in the mountains of Forta Jalon. Forta Jalon is in Guinea, uh, which is about 85, 90% Muslim country, very devout place. Um, unfortunately, the Europeans, when they came, completely messed up the uh, linguistic and ethnic distinctions of West Africa because they came up from the coast. So they created all of these kind of long, narrow countries like Togo and Benin and Guinea. So you have often pagan and Christian coasts, which generate sometimes the national elites because the French favored them. And the hinterland, the inland, is Muslim. Ghana is another example of that. And they've had to cope with, with this. So the dominant ethnicity in the Futa Jallon is Fula, Fulbe, Peol, they call them in, in Senegal, basically the Fulani people, who are located really all over West Africa from the Atlantic coast um, uh, to almost to Lake Chad, Maiduguri and the Borno region, of the top right-hand corner of Nigeria. Uh, and they uh, are today known as being very committed Muslims, nomadic pastoralists. Everybody thinks of the Fulani as the guy who stands on one leg all day with a spear with lots of 
cows next to him, but they're um, agriculturalists uh, as well. And the Fort Ojalon is, is very fertile and uh, has a sort of a rich agricultural uh, uh, tradition. And if you study the history of Tasawwuf in West Africa in particular, you'll see that one way in which the Turuq and Islam spread was through the cultivation of the land. Ahmed al-Bamba, after the French had exiled him, came back and established his new city at Tulba Dar es Salaam, which is now this quite amazing place. Uh, uh, and he did that by telling his murids to cultivate the land. Uh, this is to the south of the Sahara, so you can actually grow crops, ground nuts, cassava, sorghum, bananas, and so forth. And if you use the land properly, and once the politics has been stabilized, um, these are very rich places. So the, the Futa Jalon, uh, the main city there, certainly the city of the Olama, is called Labe, L-A-B-E, and the French put a little accent on it because they want to civilize these languages by putting in the grave and the um, circumflex, it just looks better. Uh, the city of Labe, which is a real powerhouse of the Olama, was founded in 1755 by somebody called Karamoka Alpha, who is a name to conjure with in scholarly circles in West Africa and will give us a sense of where this later idea of the Fulani Jihad, of which Nana Asma was a part, might have come from. He really is regarded as the one who clinches the Islamization of this quite difficult landscape. It's a bit like the Caucasus. Mountains go up to one and a half thousand meters, steep ravines, uh, a lot of rainforest. Um, at the time, of course, lions. Um, it's uh, difficult terrain. Um, he is the one who <coughs> decided to take up arms <coughs> against the traditional elites. And you have to understand what this is about, because I've already mentioned that the spread of Islam to the south of the Sahara isn't really through Muslim countries to the north sending armies down. They never did that. Uh, but instead comes about through a slow percolation followed by political consolidation through what's called a kind of jihadist principle. But the jihadist principle is not Muslims against pagans, and certainly not Muslims against Christians, because there wasn't a single Christian in, in these places at the time, uh, but is to do with these charismatic preachers who object to existing monarchical cultures and their, their heavy burden of taxation which they lay upon a kind of ensurfed population. And this is one reason for the success a uh, couple of generations later of the jihad of Osman Danfodio in, in Hausaland in what's now Nigeria. If you look at the people who are coming to these people, um, Karamoko Alpha had 99 disciples, maybe a legendary number, but that's what they tell you in Futa Jallon. And they're the ones who won the great battle um, against the, the traditional elite of the Futa Jalon and the Guinean areas to the south, towards the, towards the coast. Uh, and the, those 99 were not really drawn from the traditional elites. African society was very hierarchical. Um, uh, and there were priestly as well as royal castes. But these 99 tended to be people who were kind of freebooters, disaffected, sometimes escaped slaves. Um, just dissidents, uh, people who had suffered uh, and weren't really part of the traditional, uh, the traditional elite. So the Battle of Talansan, that was his great uh, victory, uh, in which his 99 Muslims, according to Futa Jalon tales, defeated the great host. Uh, and after the, the battle, uh, a council of ulama was created, nine ulama of these uh, Fulbe people, and each alim was responsible for the civilizing, if you like, of one of the nine provinces of the Fulta Jalon by being the Qadi and ensuring um, the, the correct practice of the religion. And one of Karamoka Alpha's directives to them was that they should respect the masters of the soil, by which he meant that they were not to turn out the old elites, but simply to uh, uh, cancel their old practices. Uh, and so Labe becomes this big 
uh, pacified centre, and even today it has the second biggest market in Guinea. The biggest one is the Medina market in Conakry, which is near the big mosque, which is a completely amazing place, especially if you really like buying sort of plastic crockery from China. It's, it's <laughs> uh, not really for tourists. Um, but there's another really big one in Labe, and that starts to get uh, commerce moving, and Islam is moving to the south of the Sahara in a civilizational rather than just a nominal way. Um, so we have uh, a number of ulama who then become exemplary figures. Tierno Alio is one of them who's still celebrated across the region, who comes and asks um, Karamoka Alpha uh, if he can come to these lands uh, and teach. And Karamoka Alpha says, well, shall I give you a village or uh, an area of land or some wealth? And he says, no, I just want enough space for my grave. And that's all I need. So he gives him the space for his grave. And he lives as a kind of Zahid, calling people to Islam. And he's called the Imam Ratib of Futa Jalon, is known for that um, to this day. The first great Imam of the, the great mosque there. Um, Tierno Diawo, who is a more recent um, Fulani figure, dies in the 1980s, I think, because uh, this is still very much a living tradition. It's, it's quite remote and hasn't been messed around by tourism or fundamentalism or anything much. There used to be a railway, but I think it's not working any longer, so it's quite protected. Certainly no internet. When I was in Timbuktu, there was only one cafe in the whole town where you could get an internet connection, but it's kind of dial-up and very problematic. So it's, it's a protection for these places. So Tierno Alio uh, has given us this great poem, which is the history of the Olama of Futa Jalon, 409 verses, and it gives you a summary of the great Hadith scholars, and the great, um, the great Mufassirun. So this becomes really a powerhouse. Uh, and one of the things that's happening, and this becomes significant for the Fulani Jihad, it's better known of Osman and Fodio further to the east, is that uh, they see that the old strict hierarchies, which really aren't based on any kind of universal ethics, but on keeping the masses in their place, are rooted in the indigenous religion, which is essentially a form of witchcraft. It's about placing spells on your rivals. Every house has its own rather crude idol, which you offer sacrifices to. And there's no real sense that religion is about universal virtues. It's just about, you know, what, what can I get out of this situation and out of this person? It's very, very similar to the, Islam, to the pagan religion of the Arabs of Mecca before Islam. It's not really about universals. It's about, you know, what can this God do for me and my family and my tribe? And because that is, in many ways, the norm, the alternative to the monotheistic paradigm in ancient societies, you find that uh, the Qur'anic polemic against that, the Qur'anic argument for the poor and the refugees and the dispossessed, etc., and its polemic against the kind of magical practices of the elites, fits very well in the context of a place like West Africa and is one reason why Islam, even though it's from a very different place, is a very good fit, and these people become very, very profoundly Muslim. Uh, from these areas, not just the Futa Jalon, but an area closer to the Atlantic coast called the Futa Toro, you have Fulani's, well, there's a kind of nomadism is to some extent in their blood, moving around, and the family of the famous Sheikh Osman Dan Fodio actually originates in Futa Toro, which is near Futa Jalon, but they come in the 14th or the 15th century according to the stories. So they're not local, they're from elsewhere. Uh, the story of Osman Dan Fodio is, uh, it's, it's the great story of Muslim, the Muslim Sahel, Muslim West Africa, really. Um, although he's not the main focus of today, uh, we need to get our heads around his story because it's kind of emblematic. Uh, he was born in 1754 in a town uh, near a kind of city-state which is called Gobir, G-O-B-I-R, which is the biggest political unit in inland West Africa at the time, it seems. Uh, nominally Muslim, but in practice, um, 
there isn't much Islam going on. Some of the rulers have Muslim names, sort of Muslim names, but uh, basically it's still uh, uh, a state ruled by practices of uh, magic. Uh, Danfordia is from a family called the Toronkawa clan. These are the people who come originally from much further to the west, the, the Futa Toro area. Um, the atmosphere in Al-Kalawa, which is the capital of, of Gobia, becomes increasingly hostile to the ulama. Um, and there's various rules, like the sultan bans the wearing of the turban. He bans the wearing of uh, any kind of head covering for women and so forth. And the family move um, from, uh, from Al-Kalawa to a place called Degel, D-E-G-E-L. It's that kind of hijra, and sometimes it's referred to as the Sheikhul's first hijra. Um, and there uh, he studies with his father, Muhammad Dan Fordi, and he becomes a hafiz of Qur'an, studies Maliki Fiqh, Muqtasr Khalil, and the basic texts. Um, it's because he's mainly known for his sort of political work, but he has a very considerable literary output, which is not being properly discussed. But uh, these people were often quite erudite, so... Uh, I found a reference from a scholar in Mauritania who had been corresponding with Nana Asma'u, which she was well known outside Hauserland, and they were consultor on religious issues. And he says, oh, we have learned women as well. In our village, there are several women who've memorized the Mudawwana of Sahnon. Even in Mauritania, that's quite a feat, because that's like learning the London Telephone Directory. That's a monster book of early Maliki Fiqh, and they're kind of just saying, well, memorize this. Uh, so uh, these people are not superficial scholars, but they are part of you know, that tradition, which in Morocco, Mauritania, Timbuktu, is a very major core um, center for scholarship. Um, he also studies under somebody called Jibril ben Omar, who is from Agadez, which I think is now in Niger, the kind of Sahara city, uh, which is another center for the propagation of the Maliki Fiqh, rather like Timbuktu. Um, and it's through Jibril ben Omar that he receives his initiation into the Qadari Tariqa, which is the great kind of ideological principle which is pushing forward the, the dawah, the missionary work in West Africa. So we have an image of life in Degel uh, when Muhammad dies and Osman Dan Fordio becomes the kind of leading scholar, uh, first citizen of the town. He has 67 students. Karamoka Alpha has the famous 99. He has 67. And they teach in the traditional West African way, sitting underneath an acacia tree. There's no point in going indoors. Sitting under a tree is the way to do it. And they're studying in the traditional way with charcoal and boards and memorization, memorization, memorization. Uh, and also um, uh, performing the awrad of the Qadiriya. His type of tasawwuf, even though he and Nana Asma or his daughter can't be understood in any context other than that of tasawwuf, is quite a kind of straightforward type of tasawwuf. The bay'ah, the initiation rites, seem to have been just a handshake and the, the administration of some awrad to be said after the prayers. It's not a complex tariqa. It's not the, the whirling dervishes or um, the jezulia of Marrakesh. It's uh, fairly... Uh, it's, an, it's an ancient type of tasawwuf uh, based on the way of Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, of course. Um, so Osman comes of age and in his 20s becomes an active teacher. Uh, he wants to propagate the, the fiqh and, and the ilm. And he wanders around the towns of the Gobir Sultanate uh, for about 12 years, gathering disciples and spreading the fiqh. Um, and also uh, Zamfara, which is a very, very superficially Islamized area. Basically, people are still practicing forms of, of magic. And he's very distressed by this because he can see the human consequences of that type of religion. Nowadays, very often, we have this kind of rose-tinted view of paganism as a kind of 
Celtic Eden where we sort of danced around Stonehenge and loved the moon. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, if you look at the religious iconography of West Africa, it's clearly designed to inspire fear. Look at the masks, the idols, the images. It's not the kind of thing that you, know, you wouldn't want to show your baby, one of those images, for instance. It, it's about intimidation, darkness, fear, jinn activity. It's, it's manipulation. And this was really very distressing to the Qadiriya. This isn't just a moralizing desire to crush the kuffar. This is a, 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 a direct sense of human distress that there are no universal fada'il and virtues. It's just everybody manipulating different spirits to try and get things out of people. Uh, there's no real collective unifying worship. Instead, the peasants will uh, um, sacrifice some much-needed grain to the household idol every day. Or um, animals will be sacrificed at sacred rocks, that kind of thing. Um, sacrificial culture designed really um, because people are afraid and afraid of... Uh, natural and supernatural forces. It's very much based on fear. Um, so this is distressing him, and he obviously sees the solution as being Tawheed. So he, even though he's kind of committed not to going anywhere near the sultans, he goes to Gobir, and he gets an audience with the sultan, uh, and he tries to get some concessions for the local uh, Muslim communities. Um, he wants permission to be able to spread Islam. Um, and he also seems to have given some lessons to the, the heir apparent, Yunfa, who is a bit of a piece of work, maybe a little bit like the current situation in Saudi Arabia. And the, the heir apparent is kind of really powerful and watch out. Um, so you have a nominally Muslim sultan. Uh, you have, de facto, a pagan world. The main practice involves uh, the seeds of the thorn apple tree, which, when consumed, have hallucinogenic properties and will send you into interesting trance-like states. Uh, a lot of charm selling against rivals. Uh, this is how it is. But he has this key permission to teach, and so his reputation is growing. People can come to him. Uh, even though the ulama in Gobir are not allowed to be armed, not allowed to carry swords, but people come to him and they look to him for some kind of alternative. He has two sons, Abdullahi and Muhammad Bello, who both become very distinguished teachers and ulama and writers in their own terms. Uh, uh, but his main support seems again to have come from the peasantry, the people at the very bottom of the heap, who aren't really offered anything by the monarchical structures or the priestly structures of, of Gobir and are just there to be exploited or chained and sent down to the coast to be taken off to the Americas as slaves. But they, their situation is a particularly miserable one and the bulk of his support seems to have come from them. So he is based in Degel more and more of these poorer people looking to him as some kind of deliverer. Some even say he's the Mahdi, although he always denies this. He doesn't believe this, the Mahdi. Um, but then the Sultan in Gobir in the 1790s starts to become uncomfortable. Why is this? Because Osman Danfodio has had a dream. And in the dream, he sees the Holy Prophet giving a sword to Abdul Qadir Jilani, who then hands it to Osman Danfodio, which he takes as permission for himself to wear a sword. The ulama are allowed to operate with royal permission in Gobir, but they're not allowed to be armed. So in a lawless place, that's hazardous. Uh, but now, uh, this symbolic girding on of the sword of Osman Danfodio seems to suggest that this is potentially a political threat. Uh, and so a new proclamation comes out, a royal proclamation. Um, nobody is allowed to teach Islam except Danfordio himself because of his status. Nobody is allowed to convert to Islam. Nobody may wear a turban. No woman may cover her head. 
uh, this is the new law that is coming down. Uh, Yunfa, this um, kind of heir apparent, becomes sultan. He succeeds his father in 1802 and turns out to be even more difficult. Hmm? Can you imagine an heir apparent getting involved in some barely disguised assassination attempt? Inconceivable. Well, he invites Osman d'Anfordia, the most revered person in the land, and even the pagans, this is a guy we can't really get concessions out of, he seems to be not playing by our rules. He is invited to the royal court, he's given safe, uh, safe conduct, and he comes in order to plead for you know, the, the permission to his disciples to teach Islam. And during the royal audience, uh, Yunfa produces a pistol, presumably some ancient flintlock thing, uh, and points it at the sheikh and fires. <coughs> and there's an enormous bang, but it seems to have misfired, and the sultan damages his hand, and the sheikh is untouched. And in that superstitious world, everybody takes this as a sign. The sheikh is allowed to depart. Uh, but it's clear that um, there is now a relationship of war because uh, uh, the, the, so the Gobier have tried to assassinate Sheikh Osman Dan Fordio. And then there's an obscure incident in which some of the, the, the student ulama are taken prisoner by um, Gobier, and the Sheikh uh, sends some of his men to liberate them. And uh, one thing leads to another, and eventually it becomes clear that uh, Gobier has to be fought and has to be overthrown. Uh, is this, as some Westerners would say, basically class war? This is the masses led by this char charismatic kind of Lenin of Nigeria, overthrowing the evil Tsar and his Rasputin in Gobier? Uh, or is it a religious war, Tawheed against those scary statues, or is it just a dynastic rivalry between ethnic groups? Um, well, it was certainly clear in the Sheikh's mind that this is about justice, and this is about God's justice, and this is about knocking down all of those structures uh, which are clearly uh, impeding the peasantry and replacing them with the radical image of the worship in the mosque where everybody lines up as equals, something which was totally inconceivable in traditional West African society, as it was in India before the arrival of Islam. We just didn't get people from different castes standing shoulder to shoulder, foot touching foot, all of that stuff. Sometimes it gets a bit intrusive, but you know what I mean. This is a very radical thing for extremely hierarchical traditional societies that in the most important thing you do, which is worship, which is the community's public declaration of its identity and its togetherness, it doesn't matter who your parents were. You're just all kind of in the same line before the same God that's only interested in what is in your heart. This is a radical overthrow. And this is why um, he makes this move. So uh, he's elected imam of the community and declared an emirate. And at the outset, um, he doesn't do too well. There's a battle of Tsuntsua in 1804 where he's defeated quite seriously in 200 bearers of the Qur'an. Hafiz are defeated. Um, but uh, they nonetheless managed to establish a permanent base at a place called Gwandu and slowly other Muslim areas in this strange liminal world where people know they're Muslim but they're more interested in going to the, the witch doctor, they ultimately, uh, most of those in Hausaland, in Katsina, Kano, Zaria and so forth, decide to side with, uh, uh, with the sheikh, or partly because of his personal charisma. He does come across as kind of a holy man. It's part of the appeal of somebody like Imam Shamil, just the amazing individual charisma and unbribability of the man convinces them that this is a power uh, that will prevail. So after four sieges, Gobir falls in 1808, and the largest state in West Africa is now in the hands of Sheikh Osman Dan Fordio. So he himself uh, withdraws uh, he goes to a place called Sifawa 
with his 300 students and basically spends his time on Ilm. Uh, he has two wazirs uh, and a structure of administration that is there uh, using quite severe Qadri principles that emphasize the inviolability of the law and of the authority of judges, the unacceptability of bribes, um, he does establish order. And he writes a number of interesting books in which he talks about you know, how to run a state, the conduct of courts, and so forth. Uh, and he becomes not so much the political force, but a kind of moral eminence, uh, warning of abuses. Um, he has a lot of books, over a hundred. Ulum al-Mu'amala is one of his best known, in which he takes the traditional progression of Islam, Iman, Ihsan, what to do with your body, what to do with your mind, what to do with your spirit, and portrays each one of them as a fight against impurity or against dirt. The pagan religions have been really interested in impurity. You find a bit of somebody's nail clipping or some kind of impure thing and you use the psychic resonances, the dark energy of impurity in order to produce certain ghaib manipulations. And in an African context, he then presents Islam as the alternative to that, as the religion of purity. Just as the fiqh is about the eschewing of formal physical impurity, so also doctrine is about um, avoiding uh, impure beni- beliefs. In the Malmushrikona, Najis, polytheists are impure. And similarly, the whole Sufi uh, <coughs> taxonomy of the purification of the soul and the avoidance of the impurities of desire and personal whims, backbiting, slander, etc., etc., <coughs> becomes part of this rather great book, which um, uh, he writes, I think he writes it originally in Arabic, although he writes in other languages as well, <coughs> and becomes yeah, something of a classic. It's still, still available. Um, so he says that the science of Tasawwuf is obligatory because there's no other science that will teach you the method of uh, adorning yourself with beautiful traits. So he says every mukallaf, legally responsible Muslim, must learn enough of Tasawwuf to enable him to acquire praiseworthy qualities and avoid blameworthy ones. Then he talks about envy, hasad, which is often the basis of magical religion. You are always filled with sadness and misery because Allah continually pours out blessings upon your enemies. So every one of those blessings, which is in itself a blessing, is causing you suffering. Fear and hope are of the commendable qualities which you need to come by. You achieve fear by remembering your vices, the severity of Allah's punishment, your own weakness, and Allah's total power over you. Hope is the heart's joy when it sees Allah's grace overflowing and the immensity of his mercy. So there had been plenty of fear in the old pagan religion. Uh, if I don't sacrifice to this deity, my baby will die or the rain won't fall. It's, it's that kind of negotiation with un seen forces, but hope, forgiveness, uh, these are not practices, these are not principles which are generally associated with uh, crude pagan forms of religion. So a new horizon of purity is being opened up. So he has uh, many sons and daughters. I've already mentioned Abdullahi and Muhammad Bello, who become kind of deputies. Muhammad Bello becomes ruler after his, his death, and another very substantial scholar in his own right. There's a university in, in Nigeria named after him. Uh, but we wanted to focus on the famous daughter, Nana Asma'u. Uh, she is born to the Sheikh's wife, Maimona. Muhammad Be- Bello is born to another wife, Hawa. Maimona gives birth in 1793 to Nana Asma'u. And this is a bit of a surprise because according to Hausa tradition, if you have twins, she has a twin brother, you have to call them Hassan and Hussein. Hmm. If they're girls, you call them Hassana and Husseina. If it's mixed, then you call one Hassan, the other Husseina, but that's what you have to do. But the Sheikh just calls one of them Hassan, she has a twin brother called Hassan, but she is called Asma. It's kind of surprising. It seems that he has in mind, uh, because Sira is 
uh, part of their study practice, the famous Esma bint Abi Bakr. If you were with us for the Sira um, lectures last year, you'll remember her significance um, where the Holy Prophet and Abu Bakr is, uh, are in the cave uh, and the light of the night of the long knives has just taken place and Quraysh are looking for them. Uh, that uh, Asma is the one who by night uh, risks her life by going up the mountain to bringing them food and drink. So she called that a nitaqain, the one with the two belts, because she had to carry all of this stuff um, stuck into her girdle. And she also becomes a warrior. Uh, she's quite terrifying at the Battle of Yalmuk, it seems. So no doubt the Sheikh knew all of this, and he wanted his daughter to be, have some of the barakah of that strong woman, Asma bint Abi Bakr, she's the half-sister of Aisha. Okay, so two strong girls coming out of the family of Abu Bakr, but Asma is about 10 years older. So she is also a scholar. Basically everybody, the boys and girls in the family, have to be scholars. The Sheikh's house has hundreds of books in it. And these are beautiful West African manuscripts wrapped up in leather things, a really revered thing. So she would have been brought up in this world of books. And usually when her brother, Muhammad al-Bello, went off for a journey, it was to find more books. So hundreds of books in this house in Degel. Uh, and the books are all in Arabic or fulfulde. So a word about the languages. Um, there's no Arabs around, but Arabic is the language of Islamic learning. And many of her books and poems and her father's books and poems are in Arabic, <coughs> but nobody other than the ulama can use them. So they often speak their own language, uh, fulfulde, which is uh, the main form of literary fulani, which is a very difficult language. Um, those West African languages not only have it's not as simple as having a passive and an active voice, but they have other things as well, depending on who you think might have done something complex. Uh, they have uh, different modes, different voices. Uh, West African languages are often extremely complex and difficult. So Fulfulde, which is written at the time in uh, the Arabic script, uh, Ajami, uh, is the language of Fulani families. But the ordinary population speak Hausa, which is a very different language, completely different language. Uh, so they also speak and write in Hausa as well. Uh, she also writes some poetry in Tamazek, which is another completely different language, which is the language of the Tuareg people to the north, the, the nomads of the Sahara, it's a kind of Berber language, which also has its, its literature, although it's less of a literary language. So like her father, um, she's uh, highly literate in four different difficult languages, and we have writings by her in all four. Life is really Zahid. You know, this is not a royal palace. Uh, her father, although he's the ruler, refuses to take a salary and earns an income by becoming a rope maker. That's how he spends his time. Uh, Muhammad al-Bello has a vegetable garden. Uh, she does the usual female domestic chores. So it's a very uh, fitri, rudimentary style of life. By the age of 10, she has become a hafiza of the Qur'an. And then, by this time, the conflict with Gobir has started and they have to uh, escape, go into various uh, encampments. But she continues to learn. At the age of 14, she marries. Gidado dan Laima, who later on becomes the kind of wazir, the, the deputy of, of the sheikh. By the age of 20, she has her first baby, and then she writes her first book sometime in her early 20s. When she's got two small toddlers, um, she's still able to produce a book, uh, Tanbih al Ghafilin. Uh, it's clear that her father is uh, very keen on women's education. This is long before Europeanization, it's just part of his tradition. It's said to be this comes from the Qadari tradition uh, because Abdul Qadir Jilani's mother, Umm al Khair, had also been a scholar and his aunt, Umm Muhammad, had also been a scholar. So there's a precedent in the Qadariya for you know, teaching the girls, and uh, this is still the case in many parts of West Africa that. Uh, a pious education, as opposed to a modern kind of boko education, will be 
um, given to the girls, uh, along with a lot of poetry and sira and maulid, uh, qasaid singing. Um, it also seems, if we're trying to understand how she becomes this female scholar who's so revered, that as well as this qadri tradition, her father, in his kind of real dislike for the indigenous uh, honour codes of his people, had seen many of the practices to do with what nowadays the politically correct would call toxic masculinity as being reprehensible. There's a, a, an ethos in Hauseland called Polako, which is a kind of extreme machismo uh, involving uh, rituals of sort of self-inflicted pain and humiliation and rites of passage uh, as young men are initiated into manhood that is to do with a kind of exaggeration of the warrior um, stature of the man, which he saw as being from the nafs, from the ego. So he was concerned to stamp that out because very often it expressed itself in a kind of as a toxic masculinity that could take, its, take itself out on, on women. So however one interprets this, by the age of 30, she is uh, regarded as somebody who not only is a woman who in a man's world has become a scholar, but as somebody who is very actively doing things for women. Uwar Gari is her title in Hauseland, the mother of everybody. She takes in orphans. Uh, she's concerned particularly to train up a cadre of women teachers called the Yan Taro. And these are worth knowing about because it's kind of a women's tariqa, but probably closer to the tabligi jamaat, I would say, if you want a parallel in the subcontinent. It's like a women's tabligi jamaat. Uh, she uh, recognizes that the ordinary people are sunk in destructive forms of paganism and extreme forms of social hierarchy and superstition. And she wants to, as a devout woman, bring them to the purity of Tawheed. Uh, the khutbas are not going to do that. The ulama are not going to do that. Uh, it has to be done through women and women teachers. And so she creates this, basically, an organization of friars, uh, wandering women, usually women of a certain age, sort of 50 and above, because it was easier for them to travel and not be molested. Uh, and this group still exists. A couple of years ago, I had an email from somebody in Bamako, in Mali, a lady there who said she was from the Malian uh, Yantal and they're still working and basically inconspicuous because they tend to work with really poor women, illiterate women, teaching them the basics of Islam. Just as Maulana Muhammad Ilyas in India saw the Tablighi Jamaat basically as being for sort of illiterate Miwatis in UP and places that were subject to various forms of Christian or Hindu missionary activity and needed to defend themselves. So uh, a young Taro activist was called a Jajis. She would be uh, uh, charged with teaching the basics of Islam, the Farad Ain how to pray, in particular, purity rules, uh, uh, and equipped with lots of stories. Yeah, should, no point in going with books. Uh, so uh, she would be equipped with rhyming stories of the lives of Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, and of the Sahaba, and of the awliya, particularly the awliya of Futa Jalon. Uh, a lot of ethical instruction. So how to behave correctly when haggling in the marketplace. Uh, knowing about religion. So she has a poem that's still known in, I think it's in, I think it was in Full Full Day, and then she translated it into herself, into Hausa, which is called the Qur'an, which is not the Qur'an, but which is a poem that enables you in about 30 lines to remember the names and the sequence of all of the, the surahs of the Qur'an. And it's kind of a tawassal, so she asks for Allah's forgiveness through al-Baqarah and al-Imran and so forth. You learn those 30 lines and you've got the sequence and the names of the Qur'anic surahs uh, by heart. Uh, she also wrote uh, poems on aqidah, correct uh, belief, 
Uh, and then the Yantaro ladies, these Jirgis ladies, when they uh, were in a village for a while, uh, and the local women had learned to chant or sing these poems, they would then be taught how to write them down. So this was a kind of literacy program as well, using the Arabic script, the, the, the um, Ajami script. Uh, and in this way, without any kind of intervention by the ulama at all, um, the Islamic piety and literacy would, would spread. Um, sometimes in her poems you find references to some of her friends which give you a kind of sense of who she was and, and how she was. Um, so for instance, a very popular one is eulogy, um, uh, or an elegy, let's say. In Islamic civilization, we have this idea of ratha or marthiya. After somebody important dies, all of the court poems write a great sort of panegyric to the virtues of the deceased, like um, uh, Nabi's great uh, panegyric of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent and so forth. They tend to be kind of great... Uh, uh, pulling out all the organ stops of the, the language. Uh, but she writes quite a few of these, and sometimes you get a sense of her affection t with some of her friends, and sometimes these two would be in this very oral culture where people were avid memorizers. Uh, the virtues of her companions would become well known. So here's one. Um, energy for a friend of hers, we only know her by the name of Aisha. Aisha was a woman of wonder, filled with virtue, forbearing, upright, a pious servant of Allah, she was among those who guard themselves from evil by saying the tahajjud prayer, telling their prayer beads, giving sadaqah, reading Qur'an, rooting out oppressors and taking on heavy responsibilities. She brought up orphans and gave assistance to widows. She was a pillar of strength to her family and was good to kinsmen and strangers alike. Simple things, but in nice, rhyming, uh, rhythmic, metrical, hausa uh, uh, verse. So this could be memorized and sung in informal gatherings. Uh, in the villages, and the virtues of these people would take center stage in the villages' imagination, and the old stories of ancient warriors and demons and sprites would be would be banished. Uh, so, once the Antaro had reached a village and had trained up uh, people locally, one or two of them would then either go to Degel or later to Sokoto to study with Nana Asma'u herself and would then be sent out to other villages in this huge, very superficially Islamized environment and sometimes to non-Muslims as well. It would be non-Muslims who would be uh, memorizing this stuff. They had the same languages. Uh, and so the process would just kind of extend without any money changing hands. It was entirely done by, by volunteers. Uh, there were a few formal signs. Uh, one of the institutions of the uh, actually pagan kingdom of Gobia was that the sultan's sister was always called the Inna, who was a kind of chief witch, I suppose, uh, who was responsible for adjudicating uh, disputes between soothsayers who had cast oracles um, about the auspicious date for um, a battle uh, or um, starting the harvest, <coughs> um, who you could go to for talismans of particular efficacy. Uh, and this inner person, the kind of high priestess of Gobya society, would wear a particular kind of hat. So Nana Asma'u has the idea of copying that hat and giving one of them to all of her Yantaro ladies but with uh, a red kind of strip of cloth or ribbon attached to it, indicating that something new was afoot. And the red indicates the, the blood or the fire of personal sacrifice. In paganism, there isn't really the idea of overcoming the lower self in this kind of paganism at any rate. Um, but this time, this is to be a, a religious authority exercised by women but in a strictly monotheistic sense based on the practice of overcoming the nafs. Um, uh, yeah, and this red cloth would be wound on in a kind of initiation ceremony when a new Yantaro member was trained and regarded as being suitable to be sent off to some remote village. Uh, and this is, remember, a big empire 
Elora into the south and uh, up to uh, Lake Chad in the, in the east, and it's a big country. Uh, so there's a lot of them, and this winding on of the red cloth would indicate that they were officially authorised by her to go out and do this. Um, she writes poems also that seem to be for non-Muslims or for recent converts, and many of her poems, which are about the Holy Prophet, seem to be like that. As in India, very often mad poems about the Holy Prophet, now poems, are used by the missionaries. And in India, it's often the Chishti is also a branch of the Qadriya, after all, it's part of their calling. Use the virtues and the amazing stories and the miracles of the Holy Prophet as a way to win over people who may not know anything about wudu and prayer, but find these stories amazing. So she has a, a well-known poem in praise of Ahmada, which has a lot of resonances from the Burda of Imam Busiri. Let us thank the everlasting God. Praise be to the King who created Muhammad. Let us forever invoke blessings and peace upon the Prophet who excels all others, Ahmada. Accept the song of praise I shall sing, except, O people, let us praise Ahmada. Um, the board actually has a lot of influence in those places. There's so many copies that you can see. I visited the libraries in Timbuktu. Everybody seemed to be copying down the, the board. Everybody's memorised it. Mohammed Bello, her half-sister, uh, wrote a takhmis of the board, which is a kind of poetic extension. You add additional verses in the same, same metre. Um, uh, she also made a lot of use of some of her father's poems, including one called Yearning for the Prophet, which is still recited in some of the mosques in Hausaland today. It's a very, very popular classic work. Uh, and she is known for being indefatigable. She doesn't have downtime, uh, like her father. So Mohammed Bello, after his father's death, describes his father like this. He never wearied when explaining things and was never impatient if people failed to understand. To all alike, he spoke of the things which would be useful to them. And even when, as sometimes happened, he was asked questions right in the middle of a talk, he would just stop and give an answer. Uh, so like Osman, uh, the, the daughter was concentrating on ordinary people. So Gidado, who's her husband, said of Osman Danfordio, Allah helped him by decreeing that his followers should all be of the ordinary people, just like those who followed the Holy Prophet. Um, let me... Uh, yeah, some more information here about the... Uh, custom of Bori, which is the kind of magic, pre-Islamic <coughs> magic, uh, presided over by the, the Inna of, uh, of Gobir. So one of her strategies to combat this, because very often the pagan magic was to do with either making people sick through incantations or healing people. So she combats this by providing an Islamic alternative. And in the Sheikhul's family, uh, you find a lot of Tib Nabawi books a lot, and she writes book, a book called Tib and Nabi. And this book is written specifically to explain how by using prophetic medicine, which is sometimes Quranic recitations and sometimes herbal remedies of various kinds, you have something more effective uh, than the uh, pagan uh, sort of medicine man incantations of the, uh, of the heathen people. So she lists some classic ailments like dysentery, headaches, um, anxiety, what we call depression, uh, all of the things that people would have gone to the shaman or the soothsayer for some uh, remedy for, or some incantation, uh, and explains the, the hadith-based uh, remedy recommended for this. But it's also a female-oriented book in that she gives specific uh, recitations and practices recommended for things like uh, breastfeeding, childbirth, um, uh, weaning, and so forth. Uh, and she has another medicine book, Tabshir al-Ikhwan, again still used, which is basically uh, a list of remedies for uh, psychological but also physical ailments. So seen very much as a kind of healer as well. Uh, she also wrote kind of books about the history, these are monumental times, the world is changing, uh, 
when uh, her father dies uh, and the new ruler, Muhammad Bello, also dies, she is the one who gives us the most information about him and his time because she writes nine long poems uh, in which she basically outlines the, the, the sequence of events in Mohammed or Bello's life. Uh, and she writes it together with her husband. Many of these books seem to have been kind of co-authored. It's an informal relationship. They would always be asking each other for a rhyme, for instance, or to remind them of somebody's uh, name. So they do seem to have worked um, Closely, and he also was a person of very considerable stature. So, one of these English travellers, a certain Hugh Clapperton, who was passing through in 1824, um, describes Gidado as follows An elderly man, he was excessively polite. He spoke Arabic extremely well, which he said he learnt solely from the Quran. Gidado is an excellent man and has unbounded influence with the Sultan, to whose sister he is married. One of the very few outsiders accounts. And it's interesting that uh, Europeans, despite the confidences of early empire and stereotypes of Africa as the dark continent, when he actually encounters somebody like this, he does say the man is excessively polite. It's not the European stereotype of the dark continent at all. Um, stereotypes which endure. I was trying to look up the, uh, <laughs> the Fulani Jihad and this Sultanate in a very old edition of Encyclopedia Britannica from the 1960s, which has been donated to the CMC Library. History of Hauserland, according to the Encyclopedia of Britann Britannica then, begins when British rule starts. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> Remarkable, even though these people are you know, much more literate than your average colonial administrator. Um, it was just uh, an amnesia. Um, so her husband is important in her life. Um, he also writes books as well as being the kind of grand vizier of, of the new state. So he writes a book called Raul del Jinan, The Garden of Paradise, which is uh, uh, just an account of all of the miracles of Osman d'Anfodia, the Karamat, which he had witnessed personally. Not hearsay, but things that he'd actually seen in the Sheikh's uh, presence. Um, Gilador dies in 1849, still a respected figure um, when people in Hauserland call their sons Gidador, it's because they remember the, the, the memory of this person, a um, person of very considerable stature. So what I have done is to prepare a handout for you, believe it or not, if these can be pushed around. I hope you have enough. So it's the one in tiny print that I'm looking at at the moment. So in 1849, her husband of 50 years or so dies, and she writes one of her elegies, Marthia, for him, which I have here in somebody's translation in full, which gives you a kind of sense of not just her personality, but of the closeness that existed between her and her husband. So let's uh, get into her presence by taking a look at this. I turn to the Almighty who never tires. If he is asked, he gives. He alone never dies. I come to you who avails everyone because I feel lonely as I think about my beloved. The pain is unbearable. May I be forgiven and set on the path. I pray I might learn to accept what you have decided, which no one can change. The death of great people is sufficient warning to people to ignore this world, which has no virtue. Let us resolve to divorce the world three times, because this means with finality, without return. We remember the deaths of Bello and Artiku, and now the reconciler, it's her husband, he is also gone. He worked conscientiously to put things to right and benefit Muslims. He was untiringly hospitable to strangers. He honoured all the senior members of the community and protected the rights of everyone, regardless of their rank or status. He honoured the Sheikhul's womenfolk, his children and his relatives. He neglected none of them. He was close to the Sheikhul and Bello and explained their affairs. He studied the Qur'an. Oh God, forgive his sins. He was exceedingly generous in every respect. He provided accommodation for all who came. He was the same with everyone, stranger and kinsman alike. 
He constantly tended to the needs of the people, making sure that they had food and drink. Tirelessly, he helped them to endure misfortune. Likewise, he explained about affairs known to him and sent gifts to those in need, never seeking recompense. He was in charge of repairing the Sheikh and Bello's mosques and other city buildings, tasks he never tired of. He was also in charge of repairing the city gates and the tombs. He was their guardian and acted punctiliously. He stopped corruption and wrongdoing in the city. He acted sternly about such matters. He held fast after Bello's death, honouring his purpose and explaining it to the people. As for the Sheikh's message, whenever the people gathered together, he reiterated it to them. He was very serious about this. The mosques and the prayer field preoccupied him, as did the preservation of the Sheikh's books, which he collected and had copied, because he feared they would not survive, and if they were not rewritten, they would be lost. For the Sheikh had certain of the attributes of the Prophet, by the grace of the Prophet. His books were written for Muslims, O oh God, ensure their usefulness. O oh God, bless Gidado and grant him a peaceful rest in the grave until the day of judgment. And on that day, O oh God, may he, may he be given shade, <coughs> and may he be saved by the best of mankind, Amina's son. And on that day when deeds are weighed, may his good deeds exceed his bad for the sake of the prophet. O oh God, may he receive his paper in his right hand, on the bridge save him and place him with the redeemed. May he drink of the waters of Kalthara together with Bello, reunite them with the Sheikh in paradise where there is no parting. Unite him with Bello, who is his friend, in the place of contentment where joy is forever. Show him the face of the Chosen One, the Prophet, and unite him with those who see God himself, then all will be fulfilled. O oh God, receive my words. I thank you and pray for blessing on the best of mankind, his family and companions, <coughs> and all those who followed on, who faithfully followed the path of the Prophet, which is the Sunnah. The poem is finished in the year 1265 of the Hijra. What's interesting about this is that clearly she'd been close to her husband and respected him, but also what she doesn't mention is his kind of worldly titles and accomplishments. He was uh, the, the, the prime minister, the grand vizier of uh, the biggest state in Africa at the time. She doesn't even mention that. She's only interested in his human virtues, not in his CV and his accomplishments. That's a very interesting thing to reflect upon, quite unlike a modern obituary. <coughs> so she continues after his death to work and to build up her women's organization, her Yantaro. Um, and also to translate, this is a world with different languages, Fulfulde was her family's native tongue, but as we've mentioned, the ordinary people uh, only spoke Hausa, and so much of what these people did as cultural mediators was to include the Hausa speakers in the circle of, of knowledge. So she's uh, known as a translator as well between these two uh, complex languages. One of Othman and Fodio's most uh, famous poems um, is uh, in full full day called Tabbat Hakika, which means uh, no reality, no God's truth, uh, be sure of God's truth, which is his uh, advice to people who are in positions of responsibility. And so that this advice might not uh, fall into oblivion, uh, she translates this after her father's death, into a uh, Hausa, into what I'm told a very beautiful Hausa um, uh, <coughs> uh, stanzas. And it is still very, very popular in uh, northern Nigeria. So here is uh, an English translation of her Hausa translation of Osman Danfordia's Tabat Hakika in uh, Full Full Day. If you become ruler with authority over people, you are to look after the interests of everyone. Strive hard to do well, for fear you will burn. He who becomes ruler to devour the people will be, de will be devoured by fire hereafter. Be sure of God's truth. Whoever seeks a position of authority so that he can grow rich or powerful, or slyly allies himself with wrongdoers, or those who pay money for titles of authority, without doubt will burn hereafter. Be sure of God's truth. 
Anyone who wants to find peace in this world and the next should act peacefully. And anyone who refuses my advice will be sorry. But the lowest village chief who is merciful will escape hereafter. Be sure of God's truth. Rulers must persevere to improve affairs. Do you hear? <clears throat> and you who are ruled, do not stray. Do not be too anxious to get what you want. Those who oppress the people in the name of authority will be crushed in their graves hereafter. Be sure of God's truth. Act righteously toward the people and do not cheat. Be always compassionate to them. Your reward is hereafter. Do not follow those who have strayed from the path. Those who prevent victims from lodging complaints will themselves be kept from access to heaven. Be sure of God's truth. Those with a case should seek legal redress. Instead, they choose to go to influential people. They do not seek lawful judgment as instructed. Those who cause commotions and spread slander will be shrieking hereafter. Be sure of God's truth. There are some who inflate market prices and others who double deal when selling. There are still others, let me tell you, who swallow up the wealth of the treasury. The fire will swallow them. Be sure of God's truth. Other people's sole means of livelihood is in seizing property. Others lie waiting, concealed, <coughs> in order to steal. <coughs> Others cheat. They are there in readiness. Women who bind their husbands with spells will be bound up in hell. Be sure of God's truth. Those are some selected verses from this very uh, uh, famous poem, which in the context of uh, corrupt Nigerian politics is still uh, considered to be... a uh, vitally important reminder of uh, religion's severe ethics in a time uh, where plundering what is actually quite a rich country, Nigeria, with its oil wealth and other mil mineral agricultural wealth has become a kind of scandal. This voice is still a prophetic one and, uh, as I say, frequently read. So she uh, embarks on these translations to preserve the Sheikh's heritage. And also, like her husband, Gidado, she looks after the Sheikh's books. She's a kind of archivist and librarian. Books in that culture needed kind of constant uh, attention so as not to be eaten by insects. And to the south, you have humidity as well. So rebinding the books and ensuring their preservation was one of the things that she would regularly do uh, in her old age. In 1864, she dies and she's buried in Sokoto, uh, quite close to her father. And her home, uh, uh, known as the Gidan Karato, is a kind of place of pilgrimage. It's been kept more or less unchanged since her time. And the Yantaro is still regarded as the place of inspiration and tabarok uh, for themselves, even though I'm told a lot of Sokoto has changed beyond recognition still the memory of these people. Uh, is fragrant and fresh. So that's uh, a kind of brief summary. Was it a simple life? Well, simple, I guess, in the, the best sense. Not a complex life. Uh, houses made of uh, rammed earth, uh, simple but often beautifully crafted rush matting on the floor, simple ceramics, uh, the Qur'an, everywhere, poetry everywhere, uh, maulid everywhere, and a determination uh, which runs throughout the life of this family and the Toronkawa clan uh, generally, that religion is for uh, everyone and particularly for the poor and the mustadafin. Success of the mission of the Holy Prophet, as we saw last year, was through his inclusion of those who had never been included and his problematizing of the idea of inherited rank and wealth and prestige, a completely subversive and revolutionary idea in that context. And so it was in the hierarchical world of uh, the Sahel and 18th, 19th century West Africa. And the same revolutionary Sira principle turned out still to be effective and transformed so many lives, taking people out of the fearsomeness of uh, magical a uh, despotic, absolutist, hierarchical, tribal world into a world where you could speak different languages and you could become a member of the Tariqa or the Yantaro, irrespective of your ancestry, and everything leading ultimately to the mosque, where it's always first come, uh, first served, um, 
who is in the front line, whoever gets there first. Uh, this is the revolutionary principle of Islam, which we often tend to forget, and the extraordinary transformations which it brought in the lives of those who were voiceless, who had no literacy, who had no capacity to answer back in a despotical age. And it's through these people and their preference, really, for the poor and the downtrodden and the things that they did for widows, orphans, and those other Quranic categories, the zakat recipients generally, uh, which shows that uh, only monotheism can lastingly make a moral difference in those uh, contexts. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make her memory fragrant and inshallah give her light in her grave and inshallah inspire us men as well as women in this age to remember those essentials of religion which about justice uh, and about the light and hope of monotheism rather than focusing to uh, obsessively on issues of uh, the furo, which is the plague of the Muslims of our time, it seems to me. Let us get our priorities right. Barakallahu feekum, wal'afu minkum, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.